Uh, we uh, have now reached one minute past the hour, and um, we are about to start. Um, my name is uh, Victoria Engstrand Nyakshu. I am the head of communications here at the Nordic Africa Institute. We are now very soon about to start the, the proper webinar uh, called Actions to Prevent Pregnant Girls from School Dropout, Lessons Learned from COVID-19 in Uganda. A few points of uh, housekeeping first. After the presentations, our moderator, senior researcher Viola Nailane Akato, will welcome questions from participants. Please note that the questions need to be posed in the Q&A function, not in the chat, but the Q&A function. If you have any other questions about technical issues or anything else, uh, please send them to myself or to my colleague Jim Jormanainen in the chat function. But with that, I'd like to hand over to our director here at the Nordic Africa Institute, Dr. Therese Schemander Magnusson, uh, who will say a few words of welcome. The room is yours, Therese. Thank you so much, Victoria, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Honorable Minister Sara Nira Bashitsi Mateke, the Minister of State for Youth and Children Affairs in the Ministry of Gender, Labor, and Social Development in Uganda our keynote speaker this afternoon, our discussants in your respective capacities, the audience online, dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this online webinar. And let me start by wishing everyone a happy new year. My name is Therese Schumann Magnusson and I'm the director of the Nordic Africa Institute. The Institute is a Swedish public agency under the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and a beneficiary of several Nordic governments. For the past 60 years, we have, together with our partners in Africa and in the Nordics, identified issues and performed high quality research on relevant societal challenges on the African continent. Our role is to bring African perspectives to Nordic policymakers. We want to inspire, but also challenge Nordic thinking and create a platform of mutual learning between research, policy and practice. So as the African Nordic, Nordic Africa Institute, we are therefore delighted to host our first webinar this year on actions to prevent pregnant girls from school dropout, lessons learned from COVID-19 in Uganda. And there couldn't have been a more profound topic that is ushering us into the new year 2023. <coughs> this webinar brings us to a debate based on a recent study conducted in southwestern Uganda on school re-entry after teen pregnancy. The webinar will not only challenge us to reflect on the barriers to school return by school age mothers, but it is also a clarion call for inclusive learning environments for girls' education mm -hmm. after pregnancy. By centering on girls' education after pregnancy, we are making a decisive choice not to sit back, but to wake up and act. It is an opportunity to translate important research evidence to guide actions and steps to deal with real issues that greatly hinder progress on SDG 5 and other global, regional and national agendas on gender equality. As an mm -hmm. institute, this debate contributes directly to our work on equality, social justice and inclusion in our new institutional strategy. In the case of Uganda, we are talking about providing opportunities to about half a million girls and their children who essentially had their educational dreams cut short during the COVID-19 pandemic, which kept over 15 million children out of school for close to two years in Uganda. But let me not preempt, but invite my colleague, Viola Nila Nyakato, a senior researcher with the Institute and a senior lecturer at Babara University of Science and Technology, Uganda, who apart from facilitating the discussion, will present the research evidence and the policy recommendations. Thereafter, Honorable Minister Sara Nirabashitsi Mateke will give her keynote address, followed by a discussion. 
I welcome you all to this timely and crucial conversation and knowledge exchange. Let me hereby hand over to you, Leila. Thank you. Thank you very much, Therese, for the welcome remarks and uh, for highlighting the importance of this um, uh, webinar, but as well for sharing more about the role of uh, the Nordic Africa Institute. As Teresa has mentioned, I will give a brief presentation about the, the topic tonight. And uh, before that, I want to welcome our panelists and we will be introducing them later. And also the minister will be joining us to give her keynote address. As Teresa has mentioned, we are talking about the uh, the webinar is on the actions to prevent girls from school dropout, lessons learned from COVID-19 in Uganda. It's um, a, a webinar based on uh, a, a policy brief that has recently been published by the Nordic Africa Institute. And um, allow me to highlight the key issues as far as teenage pregnancy is concerned in Uganda. Uganda is not only uh, one of the countries that has the youngest population in the world, but uh, with a median age of 16 years, but also it's the country that has high rates of teenage pregnancy. As you may see in the picture on your, on your left, on your right, it's me in the field and the baby that I'm carrying is for one of the teenage mothers. And uh, teenage pregnancy in, in Uganda is higher than the rest of the countries in the region. Uganda has the teenage pregnancy estimated at 28% uh, uh, as per the UNICEF recent study. And these girls, uh, these pregnancies are among girls aged between 20 and 24 who gave birth by 18 years. And the sub-Saharan rate is estimated at 26% and the global rate at uh, at uh, 15 percent. And when we talk about the effects of COVID-19, I will highlight just a few. We all know that COVID-19 has had a range of effects, but when it comes to teenage pregnancy, Uganda experienced um, a rise in uh, teenage pregnancy and according to UNICEF, uh, there was an increase from the rate of 2019, between 2019 and 2021. It's estimated at over 21,000 21, girls became pregnant. And among these ones, the, the rate was higher among the young adolescents, the very young ones, aged between 10 and 14 years. And there are many reasons as to why the very young adolescents were mostly affected during the time of lockdown. It is estimated by the, in the study by the Forum for Africa Education, Forum for Africa Women Educationists, that in this age group, teenage pregnancy among some sections of the country increased to as far as 366%. These girls would commonly be in school, but during the lockdown, they were out in the community. It is also estimated that um, uh, uh, managing teenage, teenage reproductive health care. Um, increase the, 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 the budget of the Ministry of Health. Um, over 362 million US dollars was spent on reproductive health care of these young girls. And 28% of maternal death are attributed to teenage mothers. And when it comes to education, it, it was estimated by the study by UN, UNFP and National Planning Authority in Uganda that 30% of the pre-COVID going, school going students would not return to school. And teen mothers, 64% of teen mothers will never complete primary education and 60% of them would end up in, 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 in peasant farming. Uh, we conducted a study in, in May and June 2020, this 2022 in three districts in southwestern Uganda, that is Vara, Rampara, and Insigino districts, and involved 77 young mothers aged between 13 and 24 years. And these were mothers, young mothers who were previously in school. Among these ones, 73% of them were in upper primary education. That is those who were 
um, primary seven is on average around um, 13 years. And, um, and so between 13 and, uh, and around um, uh, 11 years, and some of them are older. So, and only 20 of them were in secondary education, and actually only one was in, in only one was in, in a tertiary institution equivalent to university. These studies, these findings were later discussed at different levels with different stakeholders at the district level with the parents and education officers and religious leaders, and later for a national dialogue in September last year. This study highlights five barriers to school entry, and these are the negative self-perception that arises from being criticized, offended, and named. It is shameful to be a young mother, a teen mother on that to be pregnant outside school, as well as outside marriage. And another barrier to school re-entry is that uh, girls have burdens of childcare because most of them will be single mothers. Out of the 77 girls who participated in the study, only seven of them were staying with their partners. Others were either staying with their families or uh, caring for the children by themselves. So teen, teen, teen pregnancy increases, uh, it brings uh, economic burdens on, on young mothers as single mothers. Because of the shame that comes with pregnancy, um, there's tension in school for the few who went to back to school, only two had gone back to school, and also family tension resulting from the shame that comes with uh, being a teen mother. Usually a mother is blamed for her daughter's pregnancy. And as well, we highlight the issue of uh, ineffective uh, school entry uh, policies. In this study, we have four policy recommendations. The first one being that uh, we recommend a safe school, uh, safe to make schools safer for girls to return to school uh, through promotion of counseling, childcare support, and sexual and reproductive health education and services to prevent, uh, to prevent um, shame and blame, but also inclusion, as well as uh, repeat pregnancies, because these girls are at the risk of repeat pregnancies through uh, school campaigns, but as, as well as uh, creating awareness in school. As well, we, we recommend that the government and its development partners should secure effective and comprehensive learning environments, comprehensive, secure, and um, uh, uh, school environments, which where girls study alone that have common challenges, such as teen mothers, have been found to effectively improve retention and completion of school. Through providing services like childcare, uh, sexual and reproductive health, health education, but also providing services and uh, skills that improve their economic state, their economic situations. So, by providing uh, support to existing civil society and non government initiatives that provide such services, would improve uh, access to education by these young mothers, but also by securing funding to support such learning environments. Civil society organizations in partnership with government departments should work towards improving um, uh, and uh, improving uh, community environments so that we prevent child marriages and, and sexual abuse that re results into teen mothers through community campaigns, provision of integrated education approaches in, and uh, involvement of cultural and religious leaders. But as well, we should look into uh, securing funding for, for to support uh, initiatives for girls and women organizations, having funding packages for promotion of girls' education after pregnancy, but as well as continuing to build capacity for ministries and government agencies that promote such programs. And this is um, uh, the summary, and uh, we, we are going to go into the keynote address by the minister. I want to first check if the minister is already in so that we get uh, we introduce her appropriately as well as uh, get the, uh, the keynote address. Uh, I can confirm that the minister has, has logged in and is with us. Okay, 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Victoria. I take this honor and privilege to welcome Honorable Sarah Nyirawasichi Mateke, the Minister of State for Children and Youth Affairs in Uganda under the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development. Honorable Minister, we want to thank you for taking this topic very important, but also welcome you to this webinar where we are discussing actions for uh, improving and stopping teenage girls drop out of school. And as well as uh, I, allow me to highlight the fact that we have discussed this matter since last year, and you're still here to, to discuss it further. We will come to we will come into this webinar and uh, uh, give you an opportunity to address people uh, on this webinar. Thank you very much. Over to you, Honorable Minister. Uh, thank you so much. Uh... I'm sorry, I joined a bit late. I had another function. Uh, the director of Nordic Africa Institute uh, and your team, our distinguished researcher, Dr. Viola Nyakato, the discussants of the topics of today's topic, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Ali Waiswa, Uganda Supreme. Uganda Muslim Supreme Council, the second deputy Mufiti of Uganda and the, mem and the member of the Interreligious Council of Uganda, Board of Directors, uh, Angela Nakafero, the Commissioner for Gender and Women Affairs in Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development for Uganda, and uh, Susan Opok Tumusime, Mrs. Uh, Executive Director, Forum for African Women Educationists, Uganda chapter, the audience online, dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen. I'm called Sarah Nirabashitsi Mateke, uh, the Minister of State for Gender, Labor and Social Development in charge of youth and children. I am pleased to be here in my capacity as a Minister of State for Gender, Labor and Social Development in charge of youth and children affairs to give a keynote address on an important topic uh, to my ministry. Actions to prevent pregnant girls from school dropout, lessons learned from the COVID-19 in Uganda. On behalf of the government of Uganda and on my behalf, allow me to once again thank the Nordic Africa Institute that has partnered with Barra University of Science and Technology to continue to bring us together to discuss and dialogue on this critical matter that is linked to the Human Capital Development Program in Uganda's National Development Plan 3. In September last year, we were in Kampala discussing at a policy dialogue meeting about the findings for the study that was conducted in Southwestern Uganda on education aspirations of teen mothers and barriers to re-entry of the education system. Now we are here yet again to address these issues based on the policy paper that has been well articulated, not only the barriers, but has brought on board policy recommendations. The policy dialogue is a clear and friendly language in which it gives each one of us a take home message on what to do. Let us start with the five barriers to school re-entry identified in the study as my sister has been mentioning with specific focus on the effects to, of COVID-19. This publication by the Nordic Africa Institute provides a, an evidence-based direction on what to deal with. It's an evidence best articulation of one, the negative self-perception that comes with being a teen mother. I, I don't know, you just imagine whoever is listening, all those that are with us, imagine you're a girl of 12 years and you're pregnant, nine years you're pregnant. You can imagine that negativity that will be around you. Young people should be protected from early marriage, and most importantly, they must be protected from engaging in risky sexual behavior. They should be given a chance to grow. 
the government of Uganda has enacted laws and policies that protect them. Unfortunately, when they are not protected and become pregnant, they bear the burdens of shame and criticism of being pregnant. This is a contradiction. Two, the resulting effect is child care burdens. These are babies carrying babies, further aggravating the situation. I remember when we were in, in a, when we were discussing the policy dialogue in uh, in September, I gave them a, an overview of how I met a young girl of nine years who was carrying a baby. So when this young girl saw the minister in charge of children, she started crying. The baby was crying and she's also crying. Now look at that uh, situation where a baby is car carrying another baby. Uh, it is a really a very pathetic situation. The school environment is tense that even those who could not have had a chance to be in school after having babies eventually drop out. You can imagine the stigma that they go through. When they drop out of school, these teen mothers become important stakeholders of my ministry. Since the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development has the responsibility and task to improve their livelihoods and ensure the well being of their babies as well. As a ministry, we provide chances and programs for skilling through our regional skilling centers in anticipation of dealing with the immediate uh, challenges of childcare economic burdens. But we are yet to develop policies and improve their chances to re enter school. We all know the significance of school completion for women's empowerment. And so we have to focus on this to ensure a concrete plan of action is put in place. Number four, the challenges of family and community tension that come with the teen pregnancy in the family and the community as a whole. It indirectly funds family breakdown and of course gender-based violence largely because teen pregnancy is mostly blamed on the mother. Uh, in the African setting, any child who is bad-mannered, who, uh, who has not grown up well morally, is blamed on the mother. So when a child in the village, or in the African setting, uh, when she gets pregnant, the, the first person to blame is the mother, that the mother did not take care, the mother did not look after the child, did not counsel the child. So you can imagine, uh, what our mothers go through. Uh, and the number five, and lastly, they need to revise the re-entry policies. This study reveals that there are policies and programs that actually work, but will need to be scaled up. The accelerated education program is one way that uh, actually allows these young mothers to catch up with the lost time and opportunity. In addition to the whole, or the role that sexuality education and school health programs in the prevention of future and repeat pregnancies should not be underestimated. Uh, this is one of the arguments that I had with one of our development partners who insisted that children should go back to school, yes, and go back uh, with their babies. Of course, if there are no facilities to go with the babies, it is a challenge. But even leaving the girls at home gives them another chance, another opportunity again to repeat the pregnancy. So it is really a very a complex situation, uh, which we still may be from your study, uh, Dr. Nyakato, I believe that uh, we will get uh, to see how we can solve such an issue. The policy recommendations in this policy brief are commendable as they give each one of us an opportunity to undertake our work and activities in a systematic way. The recommendations are clear, and as a ministry, we are going to study them further for a way forward. On that note, I wish to inform you that next week on Wednesday, 25th, uh, January 2023, we shall be having the second dissemination of the national strategy to end child marriage and teenage pregnancy. This event is aimed at one, orienting MDS 
uh, development partners, CSOs, academia, religious and cultural institutions, and the media on the second uh, on the second national strategy to end child marriage and teenage pregnancy. Uh, of course, looking at the key strategic interventions, understanding and appreciating the cost of inaction of to end child marriage and teenage pregnancy in Uganda. Number three, undertaking the correlation between poverty and child marriage or teenage pregnancy in Uganda. It will also be looking at appreciating some of the key practical models to end child marriage and teenage pregnancy in Uganda. Number five, it will also be there for us to understand the school re-entry strategies for pregnant and parenting teens in Uganda. And I think this is where we shall buy the ideas uh, from the research that our sister has made. In integration of the strategy interventions into MDS, ministerial policy statements, partnered programs, plans, and budgets. Understanding the key roles of the different stakeholders and the linkages therein in implementation of the national strategy. And lastly, or to also be looking at how we can mobilize resources from development partners and CSOs to disseminate and implement the second national strategy to end child marriage and teenage pregnancy. You may clearly note that there is already a path demonstrated above in putting into action the recommendations embedded in the policy. Before I end this address or keynote address, allow me to emphasize on what we have done and which we are set to do. One, we have not stopped to emphasize the cost of inaction that is based on the study carried out by NPA that my sister was talking about in 2021. The study revealed that teenage pregnancy had stagnated at 25%, uh, but was uh, exacerbated by COVID-19 pandemic. The study further revealed that government will continue to lose 64.5 billion Uganda shillings annually on healthcare on teenage mothers and their children if no action is taken. Comrades, this amount of money added to what families spend on assisting teenage mothers can do much for us as a country in as far as improving service delivery is concerned, if it is saved. We continue to disseminate and make reference to these facts of action, for action. We cannot fail to emphasize and applaud the significant role of the Minister of Education under the leadership of the First Lady, Mama Janet Museveni, for the effort to give teenage mothers a second chance to return to school. Originally, if people can recall in our culture, it was very hard for any girl to go back to school after giving birth. And uh, on top of that, maybe Dr. Nyakato could be knowing clearly that in those days, when a girl would get pregnant, they, in, our, in our area, they would look for a very serious cliff where this woman, this young girl, this lady has brought shame to the family and the best thing is to throw her down and she dies because she's not fit to stay in society because of the shame she has brought. So we really applaud the first lady, uh, Mama Janet Museveni, who has really uh, been at the front line uh, to fight for the young girls, the mothers, uh, to give them a second chance to return to school. The re-entry guidelines put in place by Ministry of Education and Sports must therefore uh, be respected by those in authority to ensure that these teenage mothers stay in school. Uh, of course, there are some recommendations that uh, Dr. Nyakato made that I feel if, uh, if Ministry of Education also is online, would really buy on how we can have these children being taught separately, maybe on weekends, uh, if we are looking at stigma, they can be taught separately during the weekend, or if it means uh, studying in the evening, they're given that opportunity. Yes, much as we are looking at skilling, but uh, the skilling will not be enough. I think the idea that uh, Dr. Nyakato brought out that uh, we may think of going informal but also look at the formal way because it is sustainable. And of course, it will help them uh, sustain their families a longer time. Uh, of course, we, we, we request that Ministry of Education 
continue spearheading this. This, in the long run, will lessen the burden on families, communities, and the country. Ministry of Gender, Labor, and Social Development, working with partners, launched the second five-year national strategy uh, that I have already told you about. And this strategy envisions a society free of child marriage and teenage pregnancy. And uh, of course, we have different focuses on that, improving on the legal and policy environment to protect children, uh, strengthening the family and community capacity uh, to support these children and end uh, child marriages and teenage pregnancy. Of course, we are also looking at changing the negative and harm social, cultural, and religious norms and practices that I've been talking about. Of course, even changing their mindset and societal beliefs that drive child marriage and pregnancy, teenage pregnancy. Of course, increasing access, uptake, or utilization of quality social services like education, health, child protection, justice, social protection at national, uh, district, and community levels. We are also looking at strength, strengthening the birth registration and certificate, which is very key. We are also looking at building avenues for economic empowerment, resilience building, and also improvement of livelihoods. We are also looking at strengthening the nationwide capacity for research, data management systems. I believe that the research that my sister has uh, come up with will also contribute to our data management system. Knowledge sharing to improve programming and advocacy for ending child marriage and teenage pregnancy. Uh, strengthening multi-sectoral coordination and collaboration for effective management of the national strategy to end child marriage and teenage pregnancy. Of course, we are looking at uh, financing, engagement and partnership for effective implementation of the strategy. Ladies and gentlemen, these strategic actions call for collective effort from all of us. Each one of us must play a part to ensure that we make a difference in the next five years of implementing our strategy. The strategy proposes some simple but important actions like child uh, birth registration, which can create a big impact if promoted at all levels. Uh, colleagues, you must also be aware, my sister who has done the research with your friends, the many defilement cases that we have lost, especially in court, because most of these young girls don't have birth certificates. So the perpetrators are easily let off the hook after impregnating these teenagers who usually move on to the next victim. Let us go out there and encourage relatives, parents in our communities to ensure that we register these children and also have birth certificates. As a ministry, we ensure that such cases of abuse, including teenage pregnancy, are responded to. We are having strengthened, we have strengthened our capacity of the Uganda Child Helpline, or 116, which is a toll-free number, by upgrading and reporting, uh, reporting system to handle more calls and expanding its scope to manage cases of gender-based violence. Uh, to provide more avenues of reporting, of course, we have put in other applications like SafePal, uh, which, which you can use whether you have a smartphone or not. And of course, it is from this uh, from these uh, applications that we put in place, we are able to share information, especially on sexual reproductive health, uh, issues to do with HIV AIDS, gender-based violence with young people. For inclusiveness, those without smartphones, of course, I've told you it is very easy. You can still uh, use star 260 hash and we are, we are able to get in touch with any victim or anyone that is reporting. In conclusion, I call upon you to rally people in our institutions and communities to use these platforms to report the abusers. And of course, uh, this will help us to, to, to reduce on these other people that go to spoil our girls. Don't just watch, do something at every level or at your level. Make a difference in the life of a teenage mother by helping her return to school connecting her to an essential service or a livelihood project. Together we can end child marriage and teenage pregnancies in Uganda. On a special note, I want to thank once again the researchers. We have shared a lot and they have very good 
recommendations that I believe uh, we can use as government to move to another level. And uh, I do once again want to thank uh, the Nordic African Institute, Africa Institute that has really supported them and which has continued to support Barrera University of Science and Technology to carry on this research and more other researches that, uh, that they are carrying on. And uh, at the moment, I would even request Dr. Nakato, don't stop there. I believe that we still need to do a research, especially how our parents relate with our children. That is very, very key, especially on issues to do with sexual reproductive health. In the African culture, it is, it would be, it is very hard to find a parent who sits down the children and uh, they begin discussing issues on sexual reproductive health, which, is the, which I feel that uh, it, it takes us back. Uh, and another thing, not every parent that has a child is a parent. I think we still need to do a lot on parenting. Uh, we need still to do a lot of parenting because parents have left the responsibility of looking after children to teachers, to churches, uh, to mosques, and they believe that that's where the child will, will learn more from. But I believe that the first school of a child is supposed to be home, and the first teacher is supposed to be the parent or the guardian, which is very, very key. So I, I request uh, my sister and your colleagues that do not stop there. We still need your your intervention, we still need to do a lot of research on how we can bridge the gap between the parents and the children. Uh, as we are talking about, yes, we have some parenting guidelines, but they may not be enough. I think we need to do more research and uh, still build on that, on the par parenting guidelines. Thank you so much for listening to me, uh, for God and my country. Yeah. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister, for articulating the issues and packing the policy brief, but as well as uh, sharing with us uh, what is already going on um, in the ministry and appreciating the fact that we need to ensure that uh, evidence translates into action. We will be coming back to the issues that you have raised, and I'm very sure that some of them will be highlighted in the discussions. Earlier on, when we started, our director, um, Therese, was, uh, had issues with her camera, but uh, I think she, we, I, I would like to let you know that she's still online and we are still with her. Therese, there she is. So we are going to go now into our discussion. And um, we have three discussants. The minister has, uh, uh, has um, talked about them. And in, in her opening remarks, we have Angela Nakafero, the Commissioner for Gender and Women Affairs, Minister of Gender, Labor and Social Development. And uh, Angela, um, that's Susan. We have Susan um, Apok, the Director for, Executive Director for Forum for Africa Women Educationists, Uganda chapter. And Susan will really be explaining her experience of being at the forefront of women education as a chapter in Uganda, but as well the different experiences across the Africa as far as girls' education is concerned. Susan, you're most welcome. Our next uh, speaker will be um, will be uh, Angela Nakafero, Commissioner for Gender, Women, and and, uh, and 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 Gender and Women Affairs in the Ministry of Gender, Labor, and Social Development. And Angela will highlight concerns uh, around the ministry as a technical person. We have had the statements of the, of the minister. Angela is at the, at the forefront of the technical issues when it comes to uh, women and gender issues, and particularly the girl child. And we have the honor and opportunity to, to have among the discussants, Sheikh Muhammad Ali Waiswa, Uganda Muslim Supreme Council, uh, um, second deputy Mufiti of Uganda, and member of the Interregious Council of Uganda and the uh, board of directors. The, the, the Interreligious Council is an important body in Uganda as far as culture is concerned. And I think also the minister introduced issues of culture and the positioning of women and girls and also the, the issue of girls education after pregnancy and the different cultural practices that we have seen 
some of which could be disadvantageous, but also there could be also other cultural practices that we have to that we have to take advantage of that are actually positive and in the promotion of girls uh, of girls and women's well-being. So for now, we will move into the discussion, and we shall start with uh, with Susan. Yes, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, all protocol observed. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Viola, for uh, the presentation. Um, just talking about um, girls' education, girls' pregnancies, I would just like to present an example of um, a female girl who's gotten pregnant. Uh, out of defilement, uh, resulting into pregnancy because she was caretaking um, her mother in hospital, um, an 11 year old girl uh, who eventually, because of the pregnancy being defiled by someone at the hospital uh, when the mother sent her uh, to buy something, um, eventually comes out and says, if I got this man, I'll kill him. And this is the uh, situation for many of the young girls because 46% of um, girls uh, actually have or have had unwanted pregnancies and this has limited them uh, from going to school. Now for Fawe Uganda and for Fawe as a fraternity, our mandate is to ensure that girls um, attend education, uh, complete their cycles of education and lead dignified lives. And because of the various challenges that um, girls have uh, seen, um, starting from the fact that um, many girls, if you look at the day to day, um, economic challenges have uh, very much uh, contributed to the, you know, the situation that girls find themselves in. Uh, during the COVID time, for instance, uh, we did a study as far as Uganda, and we found out that um, 67.67% of the uh, parents actually sent um, their girls out uh, to, to have intimate relationships in order to fend for the family. So you look at uh, the poverty as well as the economic situation of girls uh, kind of fostering um, teenage pregnancies um, and the situation that uh, girls are in. But also, if you look at our, um, the social norms, the cultural practices that have been uh, from time immemorial, uh, girls have been uh, subjected to being, um, you know, um, second class citizens. And many times when a girl is assertive, when a girl, you know, speaks out, they are kind of forced to be um, ill-mannered. They are sometimes, uh, you know, said to be female cocks, and then female cocks, of course, don't, uh, you know, because cocks are supposed to be male. So if you're termed to be a female cock, you know, you're kind of said to be um, not, a, you know, fitting in the families or in this in the environment. So because our cultures then say that, you know, a man cannot be rejected. So it puts the, you know, the girls in a, you know, in a precarious situation. And from the study that we undertook, uh, and I, um, it is also re-emphasized by Viola, the people that you know, subjected these young girls to defilement, to child marriage, to teenage pregnancies, are people that should be protecting them. So you're looking at the fathers, the uncles, the church leaders, uh, you know, religious cultural leaders, uh, friends. So you find that a girl is disadvantaged wherever she is. And because of lack of awareness, because of uh, lack of a supportive and framework and environment, because of lack of knowledge, um, because of uh, in inability to access, um, uh, of, I mean, the infrastructure and support services, uh, the girls are put at a risk and so become pregnant. So the question is now, when the girl is pregnant, then what is the situation? The problem is the girl. She didn't dress well, she didn't sit well, she didn't, you know, it's something that, you know, every finger is pointing at the girl. You find that the, the persons that are the culprits, culprits, the perpetrators do not stand in, neither are they brought to book. 
the system seems to look at the girls as the problem. And so all these factors hinder the girl from ability to actually do and engage in um, education uh, or to, to become the kind of person, you know, to, to utilize her potential to become the kind of person that she needs to be. So in essence, we as a community are responsible for what is happening to the girls. And the challenge that we are throwing to us all is that education for the girl is a right, and we must stand in to support the girls, ensure that they access education, complete education, and become better citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Susan, for your contribution and for highlighting that um, the issues we are talking about are uh, about a human being and the story of a, an 11 year old girl who was caring for the mother and ends up being defiled is um, is a story that um, that is is not unique and many people have many young girls are victims of that thank you very much our second speaker is um, angela nakafero um, from the ministry of gender and she's in charge, she's the commissioner in charge of gender and women affairs. Angela, please, over to you. Thank you very much, Viola. I would like to thank the previous speakers. This is a subject that is uh, really close at my heart. The issue of uh, young children, the girls that uh, unfortunately really find themselves in precarious situation of becoming a mother at a very tender age. More of the issues have been discussed. I personally would want to focus my discussion in terms of uh, where should we put a lot of focus if we are going to support these young babies, these young girls really to find their footing in terms of living a life of dignity, but of course in terms of uh, being protected to enjoy their childhood. Honorable Minister has uh, really emphasized most of this, but uh, in addition to her emphasis, I would like to say that we need to put a lot of effort on promoting life skills among these young child girls, both boys and girls. The mere fact that uh, if the, this girl is confident and can afford to say no, sexual advances, that will solve a lot of uh, challenges. Of course, I don't forget that uh, most of these cases are cases of defilement where girls are forced into sexual related activities. If we can empower them to say no, have life skills, it will be important for us to, to reduce on the cases of child marriage and teenage pregnancy. And picking the courage to report cases of sexual abuse is also very important. In Uganda, we normally talk about sexuality education. It's an area that is important to us. I know Minister of Education and Sports has uh, adopted guidelines on sexuality education. Minister of Gender, Labor, Social Development is still working on the guideline on sexuality education for young people out of the school setting. It's an area that we need to really prioritize because uh, once these young people are able to manage their sexuality, it will guide, it will really help us in reducing cases of uh, defilement and of course cases of uh, child marriage and teenage pregnancy. I know there are negative uh, perceptions around sexuality education, but given the magnitude of sexual violence in Uganda, which has been on the increase currently, according to the Uganda Bureau of Statistics, in a study that was conducted in 2020, in fact, it's, it was a national survey, sexual violence has increased to 36% from 22% in 2016. So it's really very alarming. And of course, are uh, uh, really for the girls and boys to survive sexual violence. It's a, it's a big challenge. Of course, um, one of the persons that worked hard in terms of the reentry guideline 
Services for Child Mothers. Honorable Minister has told us that previously, once a girl became pregnant, it was automatically that she would be out of the education system. So we, as a country, we are celebrating the reentry guidelines, but of course it requires a lot from all stakeholders in terms of ensuring that uh, we are able to operationalize these reentry guidelines. The girls themselves at times feel stigmatized to go back to school. We need to deal with stigma. Those who would want to go back to school at times they lack basic needs. And of course, I'm glad that uh, FAWA is represented here because FAWA has been supporting us. Uh, sorry, Sarah has been interrupted, but she might be coming back. Uh, Angela has been interrupted, but she might be coming back. Angela, are you there? Um, it could be a connection problem, but um, I know that she was already highlighting quite um, important issues. She has talked about uh, the promotion of life skills. Uh, the moment. Yeah, thank you very much. Welcome back. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Apologies, I think I have connectivity issues. Yeah, it's understandable. Really supporting the girls to go back to school requires a lot of facilities. First of all, taking care of their babies. In Uganda, we don't have community community child care facilities. A gap. And of course, that affects these girls in terms of access to education. And then the support of the parents. Parents really have to be at the forefront in terms of supporting these young girls to get back to their footing. So thank you very much. And of course, uh, really the policy framework is positive. All we need is to support these young girls, find their footing and back on their track for their life, dignity and protection. Thank you. Thank, Dr. You. Thank you, Angela. Very insightful issues that you're raising here and the practical issues and the fact that you're raising that um, increase in uh, in sexual violence. So uh, dealing with community factors that put these girls at risk is a very important. And you have highlighted the need to think about child care facilities, re-entry guidelines to be put in place, and also responding to cases. We actually already have a question from the, from the audience about uh, issues regarding sexual abuse reporting and management of the cases. So we now are going to hear from Sheikh Muhammad Ali Waiswan, the, the second um, um, uh, Mufit in, in Uganda, but also a member of board of directors for Interreligious Council in Uganda. Uh, Sheikh, you're most welcome. And um, we are looking forward to discussion and the debate of culture and religion in the issues of girls' education. And we are all aware that um, religious, relig religious foundation, religions and uh, religious foundations are core in the provision of education in Uganda. And they, they, uh, they provide um, education uh, to a very high percentage. Most of the schools are founded on religion. So yeah, you are a great partner. Um, you are very much very much welcome. Thank you. Over to you, Sheikh. Thank you very much, moderator, uh, our honorable minister, the keynote speaker, my colleagues, the discussants, uh, the director, Nordic Africa Institute, we indeed, as a religious fraternity, appreciate the invitation to participate in the discussion of this very important subject. And uh, as the religious leaders, uh, quite some time have been partners in providing 
the education in this country. My points of discussion shall uh, rotate about Uganda is a multicultural, multilingual, and multi-religious country and a home to diverse population groups. Religi religions have a long history here in this country, but have a positive history of coexistence in peace and uh, in cascading behavior change among their congregations. Similarly, we have a rich good traditions and cultures that give us a sense of pride. Our view as religious leaders, we view children as human beings who need to be loved, nurtured, and enabled to flourish as they define their space in society. We acknowledge that it is our responsibility to be a safe space and provide love and hope as children grow through difficult processes and seek second chances. Whereas our communities have historically restricted our understanding of teenage pregnancy to individual teenage girl, we reassert our conviction that we are all collectively implicated in this challenge. The COVID-19 pandemic wreaked unprecedented havoc on children, families, and communities, disrupting uh, vital services and putting millions of lives at risk. It exacerbated the already existing challenge of teenage pregnancy in Uganda and constituted a threat to girl-child education. To avert this crisis, the government of Uganda, through the Ministry of Education and Sports, provided uh, guidelines on school reopening that included, among others, re-entry of pregnant girls, young mothers, and fathers to schools. However, at regional East African level, we learned that some governments had no had a no return to school policy for pregnant girls, while others were pushing for a total return of girls back to school with a goal of a hundred percent transition rate for all girls. However, that what we did not consider in our context was that beyond the positive language of getting pregnant girls, adolescent mothers and fathers back to school, where the real issues facing girls and boys in the context of COVID-19. The abuse, the teenage impetuousness, the erosion of confidence, the fear of the unknown, the lack of resources to get back to school, the potential releg relegation to a house help as a young girl, and most heart-wrenching, the early marriages. Therefore, as religious leaders, we offered our guidance that it was not enough to declare that girls must go back to school. Rather, we must invest in systems and structures that would enable the girls and adolescent fathers holistic re-entry like protection against GBV, stigma and discrimination, provision of school uniforms and sanitary towels and scholarships to fund their education. So our concerns are that guidelines specifically talked about pregnant girls leaving out adolescent mothers and fathers aspiring to repair the school setting. And also most of the schools in Uganda are poorly equipped, unprepared and understaffed to meet the physical, intellectual and emotional needs of pregnant girls in a school setting. The schools are particularly 
likely to confront the challenge of accommodating and nursing pregnant girls and adolescent mothers and fathers in schools. Also, being pregnant and giving birth to a child a major episode of life. For an adolescent girl experiencing this, these events while still at school often means facing harsh social sanctions and difficult choices that have lifelong consequences. They are likely to be ashamed and stigmatized by family, community members, and peers. In our social cultural context, stigma about teenage pregnancy and prejudicial social norms about pregnancy outside marriage are still strong in Uganda. This is likely to lead to exclusion of both the mother and child. Consequently, parents and families of pregnant daughters circling adolescent mothers and boy fathers are likely to dissuade them from returning to school to protect their reputation and limit their exposure to stigma from their peers and teachers. Our concerns as well is that permitting pregnant girls and adolescent mothers to continue their education could normalize pregnancy and create a domino effect by which more girls will become pregnant. With new caregiving responsibilities, teenage pregnancy, teen teenage pregnant girls and adolescent mothers and fathers need additional child care support if they are to return to school. Hence, the need to assess the level of preparedness. Teenage pregnancy and neonatal motherhood carry high health risks. We are concerned about the school's preparedness to handle pregnancy-related and neonatal emergencies should they arise. Pregnant girls and adolescent mothers and fathers may stay in school, but frequently disengage with learning and go unnoticed by teachers. Students opting out of learning and withdrawing can still attend school, but may suffer from anxiety and depression, which may affect the learning process. We are equally concerned by the early onset of fatherhood and its impact on the boy child with the potential to affect their ability to cope with the social, economic, emotional, cognitive, and practical aspects of their lives. In some communities, these adolescent fathers are expected to provide for their expectant teen mothers, hence, pre hence pressured into cohabitation. These stressors may in turn affect the adolescent fathers capacity to return to school and indeed to parent in future. So our recommendations is that the Ministry of Education and Sports should broaden the guidelines to accommodate the three categories of pregnant girls, adolescent mothers and fathers. The Ministry of Education and Sports broaden its consultations and involves the key stakeholders, especially teachers, parents, religious and cultural leaders, school proprietors. Actively promote life skills, as my colleague has already indicated, uh, life skill education and access to quality education and services relating to sexual and reproductive health using different platforms. Strengthen our referral systems to ensure that our adolescent and youth interact more effectively with the sexual and reproductive health professionals, counselors, and religious and cultural leaders. There is need to establish alternative education programs for dropout classes who wish to pursue primary and secondary education and feel uncomfortable rejoining school 
or adult classes. Designated centers where such education where such education is offered should be established at sub-county level. We recommended that our school re-entry guidelines be backed with child care services to encourage girls being readmitted to rejoin school and address child care and nutritional needs for their children. We also propose accelerated learning programs or catch-up classes for adolescent mothers who may have been out of school before and after delivery so that they may attain the same level of education as their peers and not lag behind. This calls for, for flexible learning arrangements, such as the option to attend morning or evening classes to help young mothers who are unable to pursue full-time learning. Finally, give, given our context and in view of the above challenges, our preferred position was for the girls to return to school after delivery. We recognized that our daughters who fall pregnant in school need maximum support, not condemnation. We committed to work towards ensuring that our own schools and education institutions implement the nationally agreed re-entry policy guidelines. We are convinced that our faiths promote the concept of giving people a second chance in life. Thank you for listening to me. And we thank you for initiating this very important research that is really vital and timely to our situation in Uganda. Thank you so much, uh, Sheikh Waiswa, for that extensive uh, elaboration and contribution to the debate. You raise quite a lot of issues and, uh, and, uh, and make a, a, an important contribution. And you highlight um, that some of the issues that are already in the question and answer section, uh, asking about the, mm -hmm. who is the boy mm -hmm. father and where are these issues coming from? Mm -hmm. And uh, where are these girls mm -hmm. getting pregnant? Isn't it a, an issue to do with the community? And what about uh, yeah. if we consider that um, the issue of, uh, of, 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 of pregnancy is not only about, uh, uh, is not only about uh, sex, but also to think about unprotected sex. And so those are the issues that are coming out mm -hmm. in the, the Q&A and we shall be bringing them up. But um, you agree and say that um, it's important that uh, we look at um, as a religious institutions, as places where young people should be loved and cared for, and you provide an extensive mm -hmm. strategy. Thank you so much. Uh, members yes. and colleagues, uh, we have come to the end of the discussion panel, and we are opening up the Q&A. The, uh, the Q &A. Some of you have already put your questions and we shall pick them up for, for discussion and contribution. And if you have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A section. Uh, right now, I'm going to pick on some of the questions that have come and I'll call on, on one, one by one um, the discussants to, some of them are comments, others are questions. So I will limit myself to, to the questions that have been given. Um, I would like to ask, start mm -hmm. with uh, Angela with a question from uh, one of the online participants uh, who is saying that uh, we have any statistics on the legal redress of some of these cases of defilement. Angela, I don't know if you have any as a ministry, uh, if there are any cases and how they are dealt with. Do we have any statistics? And as you prepare yourself, I'll bring another question. And if you can as well uh, look at, uh, uh, there's a question I would like to ask, to what extent sex education in schools is in inclusive of prevention me measures? Angela, are you there?
Angela, you are mute, I think. Hello. Okay, and as we wait for, for Angela, I'll bring uh, the question, the same question from, and uh, I, allow me to bring back um, Sheikh Waiswa, and uh, someone is asking the, the, the stance of the religious organizations on this matter. I know that you have addressed this issue already because you've talked about, and this question could have come in before you, you, you discussed, but uh, they, they're asking an issue around sex education and what does uh, the religious, um, what is the religious stand as far as sex education is concerned and the preventive measures uh, against pregnancy. Check, are you on mute? Yes. Yeah, yes. Uh, regarding the question of sexual education, uh, as religious leaders, we were concerned about the age of uh, the learners. Uh, indeed, uh, the material of sexual education that prevailed in the in, in, in Previous times cut across all ages, uh, Viola, which, I ex missed which expose too, learners. But, uh, Hello? Hello? Angela, I'll get back to you. Sheikh Waisa is talking. Uh, okay. Which exposed yeah, uh, uh, different age factors to risks. Uh, uh, we also uh, anticipated uh, issues of sexual education promoting malpractices in the young learners. And therefore, we called for the concerned educators to refine the syllabus according to the ages of the learners to avert the problem of exposing the younger learners to risks of this nature. Uh, we are not against such edu uh, sexual education as such, but we are guarded by values that we should not expose every learner to issues of this nature without avoiding to you know contradict with the values that we cherish in our societies and communities uh can you remind me the second question uh i think uh, uh the second question was uh, the first question was on uh, the the issue of of uh focus uh, what is the stance of religious organization on uh, pre sex education and then uh, prevention, prevention, prevention of pregnancy, which I think you have highlighted very well, and that you're looking at the values and yes. I think age, age yeah. at which uh, certain issues are being introduced to yeah. young people. I think that's what you've raised. Maybe I'll go back to Angela. Exactly. Angela, yes, yeah, Angela, yeah. we are talking about the statistics regarding legal redress. Uh, do we have any statistics? Thank you very much, uh, Viola. You really, I need to make it very clear that uh, <clears throat> right currently we are having statistics being generated and I'm glad to inform the webinar that uh, we've improved in terms of uh, access to legal services. And uh, currently, because of the special court session on sexual violence, we've been able to improve uh, conviction rate of to 74%. This was not the case before. So a lot has changed in terms of reporting. A lot has changed in terms of uh, convicting the perpetrators of violence. And of course, we are working hard with the 
court system or justice system to ensure that uh, these special court sessions on uh, sexual related offenses are implemented in different parts of the country. That is helping a lot in terms of uh, improving access to justice. I also need to make a note on uh, sexuality education. Yes, I think uh, we need to get the concepts very clear. There's a difference between uh, sex education and sexuality education. And of course, all of us in this space, uh, I, I believe we, have, we know the difference. And what we are promoting, ladies and gentlemen, among young people is age appropriate sexuality education, not sex education. I know sex education is important for older persons, but not for our, our young people. So we are very clear on this. It is all about sexuality education, growing up and how young people can manage the different changes in their lives as a process of growing up. Of course, all of us know that the issues of hormones, the issues to do with body changes, and this is where we come in with sexuality education so that young people can be able to manage those changes. For some young people, it's a traumatic change. For others, it's not. So it's important that they get to learn these changes and what needs to be done. I would want to give an example of, uh, say, menstruation among young girls. They need to be able to manage menstrual cycles, cleanness, the products to use, are really being able to be confident as you go through these monthly cycles. I know some of them come with pains. How do you manage the pains? And of course, uh, the kind of facilities that we need within either home setting or school setting. So ladies and gentlemen, we are talking about sexuality education. We are not talking about sex education. Thank you very thank, much. Thank you, Angela. Uh, we are not, we are, we are time, but I'm going to leave out some of the questions, but I will not miss on this one. And I'll bring uh, uh, in two minutes, uh, Susan. Susan, uh, some people are asking about the, uh, the initiative towards the boys and the men in the different organizations that focus on violence, uh, women, sex education, role modeling, and positive masculinity. Could you be having a comment on, on such a, uh, a question? And then we shall be closing the discussion question so that we bring back the minister to, to give her comments. Um, thank you very much. Um, the issue about boys has been or has been coming up very much lately. And many people believe that there is um, a focus on girls. And so we are saying that, yes, the focus on girls is because of the vulnerability that girls go through, rather than the fact that we probably are only looking at, at um, the girls. So girls are disadvantaged because of their physiology, because of the cultural norms, because of the many factors around them. So the issue is how can we bring girls to the table so that they are actually at the same level with the boys? And at the same time, we are not leaving the boys out because we appreciate the fact that boys and girls live together. We live in a community, we live in a society. So all of us need to be able to be supported to be, to be able to know what is happening and how it is happening and how we can prevent the challenges around the young people so that they can grow into responsible young people. So yes, we are aware about positive masculinity. Looking at us as Fawe, for instance, we support and work with boys and girls on a 70-30 ratio, especially for uh, bursaries, education bursaries, but otherwise within all our other programs in terms of protection, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, providing support, uh, you know, ending GBV, uh, looking at the livelihood options, looking at the mentorship that we provide, we do this and ensure that we attend to both boys and girls. And uh, just to say, uh, there was um, a comment, if I can, 
uh, that was stating that uh, boys, I mean, pregnancies does not only come out of defilement and, uh, you know, and, you know, it is sometimes young people experimenting and that is very true. And in the study that we undertook, about 89% of uh, young people said they, they just tried out sex because they were idle and wanted to find out. And so the issue that we are talking about here is how can we create awareness, self-awareness about what we need to do, what we don't need to do, how and when, but also provide the you know, uh, sexual reproductive health rights information, which is part of what is in the sexuality education framework that has been halted for one reason or the other. And yet we must recognize that with this halt, many things are happening. The fact that our children are engaged in, pre in, you know, in sex, the fact that we are having pregnancies means that children are having sex. So while we can say that you know, we do not want them to learn, things are happening. So what can we do? We need to frame out, and I know that the Ministry of Education and Sports Ministry of Gender have really worked on this document because we all as uh, responsible people, as um, stakeholders in supporting the youth, want the best for the youth, and we wouldn't go out to give them information that is inappropriate. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, because of the time that we have, we have to end the discussion here. I would like to thank the panelists this afternoon. You raise very important issues and share your different experiences as far as the evidence on the teenage pregnancy is concerned. And I want to thank you so much for accepting and preparing for this, this session and for highlighting your different experiences, but also commitment to what can be done. I thank you very much. And on this, uh, at this point, I would like to welcome our minister back again. And for me, I will highlight two issues because uh, there are two frameworks that um, I think were commented on extensively by the, uh, the, the representative of the Interreligious Council, the school entry framework and the contribution that I uh, would like to be put and extension of the services that offered to teen mothers and, uh, and uh, teen fathers and adolescent fathers and adolescent mothers, as well as the sexuality education framework. Uh, the, and and um, honorable minister, we would like to come you back to respond, but also to, to, to give your uh, last words and commitments on the next steps. Like I have said, um, and you have also highlighted, we also are raising uh, new research questions. You've talked about the issue of parenting and parenting guidelines, and also uh, looking at how to empower parents to, to talk about uh, growing up with their children against the culture, uh, culture expectations and norms that parents cannot talk about sex and sexuality and growing up with, directly with their children. Honorable Sarah Nyirabashisi, um, the Minister of, of Gender, Minister of State Gender Labor and Social Development in charge of, of, of children and uh, youth affairs. We welcome you back to close our session. Thank you very uh, much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nyakato. I'm sorry, I didn't get you well. My network was not good. Can you repeat what you wanted me? Yeah, uh, we are calling you back to uh, give us closing remarks, but um, uh, the panel, the panelists raised issues, and uh, I would like to highlight the ones raised by uh, Sheikh Muhammad Ali Waiswa on the, the, the comprehensiveness of the, uh, the school re-entry guidelines and the concerns on how they can operate within the school establishment. Um, that uh, that they are asking for for them to be able to open space for school. Okay. And and other other remarks that you're giving us for closing this session. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Doctor. Uh, let me stand already on the existing uh, protocol, and I want to thank the discussants. Uh, they have brought out very key and pertinent issues uh, that I feel maybe we need to touch more. Uh, one uh, on the issue on the question that uh, 
the, the Sheikh has raised on the guidelines for opening, I would have loved somebody from education to answer that because I believe they now have the comprehensive uh, strategy for, for the girls to go back to school. I don't know whether there is anybody from education that you had invited who is part of us. Uh, then of course, there are issues that uh, were raised and which were very key that maybe we need to look at. Uh, most of the times we have, uh, we, 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 we are talking about the teenage pregnancy and the marriages, but the people who are taking these children, those, the people who are defiling these children, are men, are boys. Like the, like one, the last person has said, some of our boys go there to test, to see how things are done. Honorable and Minister, are you able to put on your, 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 cam, your video, please? Uh, video, okay, okay. sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Thank you. Right. Um, sorry for the interruption. Yeah, no, it is well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I was saying like the what uh, uh, my sister has raised the issue of uh, of uh, those who are impregnating our girls. Most of them are boys, of course, and I've said that some of them go there as a trial. At least the few that I have tried to talk to. Uh, uh, they normally tell you they have gone there to test, to know how are things done. And at the end of the day, the results come out. And I think uh, I, much as we are talking all this, I think everything comes back to parenting, uh, where we sit down and talk to our children. Much as I was talking about it, and I feel people are not comfortable that you can sit with your children and you talk ABC, ABC especially in the African setting. But it is very key that we, as we are talking about the girl child, let's also focus on the boy child. I, it's, uh, I'm fortunate that I, I only have boys. One of my boys recently made a statement, said, but mommy, why is it that all the time you people are talking about girl child? By the way, when boy child, boy child is very, very important. Then he started telling me a story that they were one time at school and they were giving out drinks and now when the drinks were about to finish, they say, the boys, you move on the side. We are going to give the girls. That we got annoyed. The boys who are there got annoyed. So that, that segregation of separating the girl and the boy, I think is also a challenge that we need to look at, that they should be equal. And uh, I know that girls are more vulnerable. But if we keep pushing away the boys, the boys will come to prove to us. Indeed, they proved to us during COVID that now we are the boys. And that's why we are making noise because the boys proved to us the, their capability. So we, we should also think of how to bring the boy child on board. Uh, and of course, yes, one of the, one other reason that really has brought us issues, uh, leave alone the, the boys trying and testing, we cannot leave out the issue of poverty. Most of these girls, I, I just fooled around by small things. There is a girl I was talking to and told me, do you know, he only gave me, uh, he only gave me a sweet. He only gave me a donut. Then you ask yourself, then he told me that we go and do this. And of course I have tried to talk to these girls. You find that most times uh, it is the poverty. They feel they also want good things. And at home they are not able to provide. So when they get somebody who can provide something small, the girls go. Uh, by the time they discover the parents, it's already a defilement. Then you go to the cases, that's it. I had someone talking about statistics. We have the statistics. I wish you had told me. Uh, they are, of course, we are generating them like the commissioner had, I mean, uh, the director, the director, Commissioner Angela had talked about. But uh, we, we have been having some statistics, especially when you look at, uh, our child helpline, uh, which, uh, which we normally use. If you look at uh, the statistics of December alone, uh, December alone, those who reported and reported these other people who are supposed to be taking care of them, like my sister, uh, Susan talked about it, said the people who are supposed to be protecting these children are the people who are abusing them. 
77% of the cases that were reported uh, on our child helpline, these were parents, these were guardians who were abusing their own children. And that's why I, I, I am still going back to what I said, the issue of parenting. Because if you find a parent, a parent defiling her, the, your own child, even this week I had a challenge, I had a case where a lady came to report to me how the husband is using the, the daughter. You know, this is a, a father who is sleeping on her own child. It, is, it beats my mind, in fact, because a parent, you're a parent, and you're supposed to be giving guidance to this child. You're the one supposed to be protecting this child, and you are the one who is abusing the child. And it is good I have seen Sheikh here. This, this is a marriage of... Uh, Muslims, the lady has more than, the, the man has more than three wives. And the wife said, I cannot talk because if I talk, this is a housewife, she will not get support. So she has to keep quiet and leave the child to be abused until when we had to get a solution, which we got. And uh, surely it, it has been bad. And we pray that it stops because this girl, basically it's not really, I think he started defining the girl at, at 15, now the girl is 19, 19 years, but we had to get a solution to that. Uh, it all comes to parenting. I want to thank the discussants and thank uh, Dr. Nyakato, Viola for, and your colleagues, not forgetting the director of uh, Nordic Africa Institute that has continued to fund such research, especially which can contribute uh, to our legislation and also contribute uh, to the policies that we are putting in place, which have proper evidence. And of course, with proper statistics that we are able to, to follow. Otherwise, I want to thank you once again. I want to thank everybody who, had, who has participated and thank all those who have been with us. And uh, I pray that uh, this research can come out to be a reality and we are able to use it. Thank you so much to all those that are listening. May God bless you. Thank you, Honorable, and thank you, our discussants and everyone and uh, participants online. We have ended our webinar and uh, we thank you and uh, we end now. Goodbye.